Here's a close-up look of the uh, at the spark gap assembly. Uh, this is in the uh, high frequency circuit, and uh, essentially what you got is you've got uh, two spark gaps here that are in series, and I'm noticing that this one was probably this welder high frequency circuit was probably not working very well because this spark gap on this side is completely closed up. It looks like uh, this carbon or whatever had gotten in there and and caused that to actually fuse together. So I don't think that spark gap is open at all. This one looks like it might be. And then, of course, these are set to a certain uh, setting. I, I forgot what, maybe 8,000s? I don't remember exactly. And you can actually fudge that, uh, that setting. I was reading online some forums about these welders. But that's interesting to me that that one looks looks pretty uh, closed up and I think the way you just adjust these is you you loosen the screw here and uh, that kind of releases some of the clamping force on the actual rod in the center there and then you can move it up and down and this is all mounted these are like uh, looks like aluminum heat sinks and it's all mounted on this porcelain porcelain base right here so it's kind of a neat assembly. If you dropped that and cracked that porcelain, I don't know, you'd probably be up the creek. I took these screws out so I could take these copper straps off and add them to the scrap, uh, the scrap copper pile, and uh, those move really easily once you loosen those clamps. So the actual contact surfaces themselves look pretty good. There's just some stuff built up around the perimeter. Uh, so I think that could be cleaned up and used if necessary. Uh, I have no idea what the ones look like on the on the air code that I'm keeping. We haven't even test fired that thing yet. All right, that's pretty much all that was left on that board was the transformer and uh, this capacitor, which I'll I'll test and see if it's any good. I think as I had already mentioned, I'm going to keep the uh, amperage uh, range and uh, rheostat assembly together, and also the polarity switch. I'll just keep that together for now. Next up is the, uh, well, we'll call this the rectifier assembly because this has got the diodes on it mounted on these plates that act as heat sinks as well as the conducting surfaces. And that's all held together. It's almost like a big sandwich. These uh, look like they might be copper tubes or no, I, I think that might be just cardboard or some kind of non-conductive. Yeah, that would have to be non-conductive because you need to isolate these. You can't have these. So that's some kind of a uh, insulator. But it looks like it's all held together with a threaded rod that goes through the whole thing. So I think if I take these nuts off the end, I can actually get those threaded rods out and take this whole thing apart. Yeah, well, I was right about how this went together. Unfortunately, the rods, I was hoping they were all thread. That way I'd have a nice couple of pieces of all thread but they're only threaded on the ends where they need to be the rest is just solid rod but hey you know what that might be useful for something never know when we might need to have something that size for doing a project the uh, insulators they are not cardboard they're almost like a type of plastic or not sure what the material is and they're actually uh, two sleeves. There's a long, smaller diameter sleeve goes through the whole unit, and then there's this uh, outer sleeve. I'm tempted to hold on to these just in case, but I can't think of a use for them right now. Well, if you were building a high-powered transmitter or linear amplifier, I bet you these would make excellent standoffs because they're obviously made to be... Uh, uh, have high uh, a good insulating quality. I'll even save these little angle plates here. These are kind of thin gauge. These are a little bit this these ones here are a little thicker. I'll, this one I've actually got to take. There's a couple of components on it. There is a rectifier right there, and uh, there's this unit right here, which looks like it might be another capacitor with a uh, resistor in parallel across it off and throw them in the box with the other small components. 
Well, I've pretty much reduced that whole thing to a uh, pile of parts. I've got, uh, these are the, the big diodes, and I'll test those at some point. And uh, I've got a bunch of these. These are small um, disc capacitors. Not sure what their purpose was in the circuit, but uh, they were almost, I think, uh, there was at least one of these between each pair of plates. And then, what else do we got here? Some, some little aluminum scraps here and there. But my favorite uh, thing about this is these aluminum plates. They've got holes in them, but they're nice. Looks like they're quarter inch thick aluminum or, or better. And I've got, uh, I've got six of them. And I, I wonder whether or not at some point if I can't put them to good use, some sort of a project, I don't know what. So, rather than scrap them, even though they've got a few pounds right there in aluminum, rather than scrap them, I think I'll hold on to them, put them with the other scrap metal uh, stuff that I have set aside in case I need to uh, build something. Now, these are the diodes and some of the other components I took out of that old welder. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do some quick checks on these um, with a simple, most digital voltmeters have a diode check feature. Now there are certain limitations to that um, and I'll discuss that in a moment but for the most part you can do a quick no go no go check on diodes. Um, diodes have a cathode end and an anode end. Now on diodes oftentimes you'll find a little tiny symbol which will look like a triangle with a line. You know what? Let me uh, let me illustrate that. All right, so this is a schematic diagram symbol for a diode. It's a triangle with a line. This is one lead and this is the other lead. And small diodes like silicon diodes that they have um, that they use nowadays, the diode won't often have a symbol like this right on the package because the package is so small. Many diodes will just have a line indicating the cathode end of the diode. So this line is the cathode end, and this triangle end over here, this is your anode. And those actually, those terms go back to before semiconductors were even invented, and they used to have to use vacuum tube rectifiers. And inside the tube, you actually had the elements inside the tube. You had a cathode that emitted the electrons, and you had an anode, uh, that collected the electrons and that's where that terminology actually comes from but they still use it today and uh, so on a schematic diagram when you see this symbol you know that's a diode and there are certain variations on this um, you know if you see for instance uh, arrows like that coming out that means that's the signified light that's a light emitting diode or an LED which we see all the time everywhere um, and then they have photosensitive diodes. The arrows would be pointing this way, meaning when light shines on that diode, it responds to uh, it, the current flow through. It changes. Uh, we have, um, sometimes you'll see a line like this and a line like this. That typically indicates that that's a special type of diode called the Zener diode, I believe. This is all, I'm going by memory. It's been a while since I messed with this stuff. But anyways... These big giant honking diodes right here, they actually have the symbol right on them. So I can see which end is the uh, cathode and which end is the anode. And you don't even need to know which end is which. All you need to know, for the purposes of testing with a meter like this, all you need to know is that in one direction, in other words, if you put the positive lead on one side and the negative lead on the other side, in one direction, you should get a reading. Uh, right now, I'm getting 0 .409, and if memory serves me, I think that actually indicates the voltage drop across the forward biased junction of the diode. Basically, what that means is that you're losing four-tenths of a volt across the junction of the diode, which is normal for a silicon diode, silicon rectifier. So, the test good that way. So that's the first test passed. Second test is, when we flip it around the other way, 
This is what's called reverse biasing the diode. And when we reverse bias the diode, we actually want to see no reading change whatsoever. You have to be careful and make sure you don't have your fingers on, on some meters. If you have your fingers on the leads, it'll actually cause a reading. But basically that's staying at OL, which indicates out of limit, which means that we're not getting any current flow through the diode. That's good. If we got this reading, all zeros going across and that diode check noise going off in both directions, that indicates a shorted diode. If we got no reading in either direction, that would indicate an open diode, but that's pretty rare. Typically when diodes go bad, they short. And then the bad thing about it is once they short out, they tend to cause too much current to flow through them and cause all the problems in the circuit, but I'm not gonna get into that. So right now that diode's checking good. There is another problem though. I am only reverse biasing the diode with the amount of voltage that's in my meter, which my meter uses a nine volt transistor battery. So I'm using very little voltage. So the question is, what would happen when this diode's actually in the operating circuit, it's under a much higher voltage stress. So the question is, is it still gonna not conduct if we put higher voltage through it? And the only way to know that for sure would be to test it with another piece of equipment. For instance, I used to own a, uh, when I had my television shop, I had what was called a curve tracer, which was really great at testing diodes and transistors because not only did it do the, the, the quick check for you, but it also gave you a visual uh, readout on the screen of the curve that's plotted by the, the diode. Basically what the machine was doing was it was able to tell me how much current was flowing through that diode at several, several different voltages simultaneously. It was kind of a neat thing. And those things had been around. The one that I had in my shop was actually, it ran on vacuum tubes. The thing was old. It was made by Tektronix probably back in 19, you know, the early 70s or something. Um, but anyways, I, I digress. Supper time. I'll be back in a minute. All right, I'm back. It's actually the next day. I uh, had some other things to do after supper, and then it got kind of late, so I didn't bother coming back down here. But we, we left off. We had tested those diodes. Um, this diode right here, when I test this diode, I get a uh, I get a different reading when I forward bias this diode. I get 1.34, 1 1.35 uh, or so. So that almost indicates to me that it's dropping 1.35 volts uh, when it's forward biased. And when I reverse bias it, I get no reading, which is what I expected, which is good. So the question is, is it bad because I'm getting a higher reading? No, probably not. Probably uh, it has to do with the fact that this probably is not a silicon uh, diode. Uh, these are old school I don't see these. I don't think they use these anymore at all. Um, I think that big orange one that was mounted on the uh, the, the part I already put over there on the s storage shelves there. I think that might be a selenium. But anyways, uh, it seems to be testing okay. So now let's move on to the capacitors. The capacitors. I've got, of course, uh, this big cap here. Uh, this device right here, I, I'm still not positive what this is. Uh, it's got enough corrosion on it that I can't see what the markings were. Uh, it's whatever's inside this tin is, has been sealed inside of here. Um, it's got these insulators. And I could test it with my capacitance meter and see what it is. But the problem is that there is a, a resistor right here. This device is a resistor. And this, this is right across the two terminals. So this is actually in parallel with the circuit that whatever's inside here. So if I try and get a reading, I'm probably going to get some erroneous readings. So typically you want to test the capacitor out of circuit, like this capacitor right here, this little disk capacitor. Uh, this, I could test this and get a pretty decent reading. These capacitor checkers that are built into these DVMs, they're, you know, you take it for what it's worth. It's, it's not really a, 
a, a, a very good instrument for testing capacitors. But it'll, it'll get you by in a pinch. Uh, the leads of the meter alone, I mean, these my leads are really beat up. I need new leads on this meter. Um, the, the leads will, will throw off the uh, the readings. Oh, i got to put this in, mode, in that mode. It's been so long since I've used this meter as a capacitor checker, I don't even remember how to... Uh, how to put this in the, the mode to test capacitance. Let's see. 